Cool. So thank you all for joining us today for our consult call in collaboration with the Mental Health Technology Transfer Center Network. Today, we are going to be talking about advanced topics in strengthening youth and young adult peer support, setting boundaries, and self-care. So here is a little bit a little map of all the areas that the MHTTC network serves. You can see up in the upper left corner, um, that is the area we are aiming to serve, um, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and Alaska, the Northwest MHTTC, which operates out of University of Washington. But if you are joining us from any of the other colored regions on the map, that is totally fine as well. A little bit about the Northwest MHTTC. Um, it is uh, about technology transfer. Oh, there goes my cat over my camera. <laughs> we disseminate and implement evidence based practices for mental disorders in our field, and the target workforce includes behavioral health and primary care providers, school and social service staff, and others whose work has the potential to improve behavioral health outcomes for individuals with or at risk of developing serious mental illnesses. And like I said, they proudly serve Alaska, Idaho, Oregon, and Washington. So this just says a little bit more about the role of the MH Northwest MHTTC and um, some of the training and TA they provide. Um, and that is their website down there at the bottom. So we really encourage you to go check it out, sign up for their newsletter and see some of the other cool tools, resources and webinars they have available for y'all free of charge. Um, this is just a little reminder we like to put at the beginning of these um, that the MHTTC network, as well as we at Pathways, um, use affirming, respectful, and recovery-oriented language in all our activities. So we strive to be strengths-based and hopeful, inclusive, um, oops, <laughs> and accepting of diverse cultures, genders, perspectives, and experiences, healing-centered and trauma-responsive, um, inviting individuals to participate in their own journeys, person-first and free of labels, non-judgmental, avoiding assumptions, respectful, clear, and understandable, and consistent with our actions, policies, and products. So um, we just encourage everyone to try and stick to these values and um, please feel free to call me or Caitlin out if you feel that we're not, you know, holding ourselves accountable to these as well. So before we jump in, we'll just introduce ourselves. Um, and, you know, my cat has already kind of fanned his fur across my camera up here. So <laughs> this is why we include our pets in our, um, pictures on these introduction slides because they tend to make themselves known whether we want them to or not. So that is me on the right there. My name is Maria Hermson Kritz and I work out of Portland State University as a trainer. Um, and prior to that, I worked as a youth peer support specialist and also a supervisor of youth peer support specialists. So I'm super passionate about this topic. Um, uh, coming from the youth peer support world, I also bring my own lived experience in youth serving systems to this work. And then, of course, that those are my pets, Twinkie, my dog, and Clarence, my cat. And then I'll let my co-trainer, Caitlin, introduce herself as well. Thanks, Maria. Hi, everybody. My name is Caitlin Baird. I use she, her pronouns, and that's me on the left with my dog, Polo, and my cat, Jude both of whom happen to be with me right now. Um, I wanna apologize for not being on camera. I'm practicing some self-care and I have a face injury that I don't think anybody wants to take a look at. So um, I'm going to be off camera today. Uh, I also am a trainer and a senior research assistant with Pathways Research and Training Institute. Um, uh, Maria and I do a lot of work together working on projects that focus on youth driven practice and youth peer support. In addition to that, I also was a youth peer support specialist working with youth and young adults in wraparound prior to my role at Pathways, and I was a supervisor for youth peers as well. Um, uh, peers who were not only serving young people in wraparound, but 
were in community-based settings and in crisis settings. Um, so with that, of course, I bring my own lived experience to this work. And I think it's really important that as a, we are working with youth peers and folks who are expected to share some traumatic things about their lives, that we're really helping them set appropriate boundaries. So I think that um, this is a really important topic and I hope that folks are able to learn something from it today. Of course, if you ever have any follow-up questions, you are welcome to email Maria or I. Also, we really encourage these calls to be interactive. So please feel free to speak up if you have anything to share or feel free to use the chat. Awesome. So we just have a little poll before we get started, um, just to know who we have on the call with us today. So we're just going to launch that and um, ask you all, what is your role at your agency? Um, and so we have a few options here, youth peer support, um, a supervisor of youth peers, um, so other kind of peer support specialist not working with young people a program administrator or other. And um, if you don't fit into one of those boxes and you are in the other camp, feel free to drop it in the chat box and uh, let us know a little bit more about um, your role. Okay, we have a Laura Smith, a prevention team lead. Okay, very cool. <laughs> All right, it looks like most people have participated. So I am going to go ahead and end the poll. All right, well, looks like we have a majority of youth peer sports specialists here today, which is awesome. Um, thank you all for joining us. Love to have youth peers here and also um, a good amount of supervisors of youth peers, which is great. Um, we also love to have, you know, supervisors who are here to learn about how to better support the youth peers they're working with. We have a few other peer support specialists, um, some program administrators, and then a few of those others. Um, so awesome. Thank you all for being here and welcome to all our youth peers and everyone else. Okay, so before we jump into it, um, the main content for today, we just wanted to start out with a little discussion. Um, so when you are meeting with your young people, how do you describe boundaries? And we're gonna go ahead and throw you on breakout rooms for this since we know that this is a big topic. You'll have uh, about five minutes in your breakout room and then we're gonna ask that you come back to the main session and identify one person who can share something that you all talked about. Okay. Hi. Hello. Hi, how are you? 
Doing well, how are you? Good, good. Um, so the discussion is how do you describe boundaries to your clients? Yeah, and we have people who are talking about that in breakout rooms. It looks like uh, you are have an invitation to room five. And so do you, Celestine. Do you guys see that invitation? I don't. I, I pushed join and then I just came back here. So I don't know. Oh. Well, let me try I, it again. Okay. okay, I'm going to move you to a different room and okay. it, then it should try and move you on back. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, that worked. <laughs> It could be my phone. I had I had trouble getting in it every time I logged in, it kept kicking me out. So I don't know if it's on my end. Oh, maybe. Well, you know what? I would love to hear from you on how you describe uh, uh, boundaries to uh, your youth and young adult mm -hmm. clients and maybe some of the topics that you include there. Oh, okay. Um, so I'm a director of the Family Resource Center in Brooklyn Zone 7, and we do have youth advocates. And one of the things that, you know, we speak to our youths um, coming in is that um, they are your support. Um, they're not your friends, um, but, you know, they are someone that you can reach out to if you're um, struggling or you need support and um in any situation that you're facing, but we try to help to uh, um, the youths to identify um, others around them that they can use as a means of, of, of support and, and engagement and maybe making friends, but they ha it has to be a, a boundary. They figure, well, they're young, I'm young, so I can, and they are really my friends. And, you know, they even text or call the youth advocates all times and night, and, and there is a cutoff, and we do have to speak to the youth. I love that you brought that up. Honestly, those are really, really common occurrences that I know Maria and I mm -hmm. both saw when we were supervisors and youth peer support specialists. And it's hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you you create sort of this... Uh, um, mutual relationship with the young person but you have to toe that line of we are friendly but we're not right friends, right because right. we all have to do things right. that are outside of a friend role like file mandatory reports if necessary things right like that. um yeah that's actually one of the big topics that we'll talk about today so i'm really happy oh great you brought that up great great um i think that you know they indulge a lot of personal information um, yeah, and then, you know, we have to speak to our youth advocates and, you know, let them know that their role and that, um, they are mandated reporters, um, and that they are here to support and, um, it's okay that we laugh and, you know, we have lunch or a meal together, but that's about it. And we try to help them to connect with other youths that are in the group so that maybe they can try to form some sort of friendship. Because some of the youths coming in, they don't have any friends and they figure if they, they are connected to a youth advocate, that's the one and only friend. Mm -hmm. Yep, exactly. I think it, yeah, we've seen a lot of that. I know um, back in, in the before times, prior to um, living in COVID land, when right. working with young people who really didn't have a lot of peers to connect with, I would actually right. call up Maria here who ran a drop-in center and I'd say, I'm bringing in a youth. <laughs> yeah, and so figuring out those resources on like, how can they connect with uh, um, other friends, uh, you know, peers in terms right. of like people their age and not people that they're working with. Right, right. Oh, what do they like? Um, we, we have wraparound. So maybe it's an art class they want to take. Maybe there's um, music they want or dance or something. We try to engage them um, in other areas so that they can form friendships outside of, you know, their advocacy from their youth advocates. And hopefully, you know, I know that some of our youths coming in, they struggle mm -hmm. in socialization. So we work on those skills and give them some tools and, and hopefully, you know, 
that they utilize it when they're out in the community mm -hmm. and make mm -hmm. safe and safe um, um, friendships out there. Yeah, and things that allow them to remain community based, right? That's one right. of our principles when we talk about rapper. So. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. we'll, you know, we'll you know we'll see. Just it is kind of hard, especially when a youth advocate themselves has their own lived experience, and it could be, it, you know, have gone through the same thing. So they do want to be a, a means of. Yep, I've been there. I did this when I was in a hospital. When I was in a residential, I experienced this, and the relationship kind of sometimes will cross, and they can over identify. And um, yeah, lines get crossed, but we have to hurry up and pull back and let them know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, precisely. All right, so everyone is back from their breakout rooms. Okay, um, thank uh, you. Share some of uh, what you talked about in your groups. Okay. Thank you. So um, if everybody's all right, I, I'm just going to jump in with what my group talked about. I had uh, Monique, Celeste, um, and I'm sorry, one other person. I'm going to butcher this because my memory is horrible, but um, where is she? Gabrielle, that's who it is. Okay. So we all talked about, we were all kind of like, um, coming from different areas, but we all kind of had the same consensus that it is important to, um, you know, address early on in the first uh, session or within the first couple sessions that we want to be clear about our boundaries, about um, times at which our phone will be on, when it's going to be off, um, uh, to just to make sure that depending on the age of the young person that we're working with, they understand that and um, something I added was I like to make sure that they are able to ask questions and intermittently throughout the conversation so that was kind of like our general consensus uh, it seemed like yeah absolutely it's super important that you start talking about those boundaries probably when you're first having your first for you meetings right <laughs> because you don't want to be catching the youth off guard or making them feel like they've done something wrong if a boundary has been crossed. So it's really important to set those up back when you're really um, getting it to be engaged with the young person so that they have a full understanding of what your relationship looks like. Would any of our other groups like to share? I can okay. share. Oh. Um, so, yep, so I'll quickly share. We pretty much were saying about the same things, making sure you establish the times when you're going to be available, when they can contact you, how they can contact you. And um, we had someone in our group who mentioned a youth ERA engagement kit, which was what they use, where they can ask, the youth can ask questions, and that can help to establish those kind of boundaries. Um, a couple of us are also mainly prevention field, so we were a little different with things, saying mainly mentioning about the confidentiality and things like that, making sure they were comfortable, maybe setting up ground rules, letting them come up with some, you come up with some, um, but really mainly um, we were hitting on the times, like it's important that they know when you're available and how to contact you. Yeah, I've seen those YE engagement kits when I used to work there. And I think um, they have like a little dice <laughs> that has different questions the youth can ask. Um, and I, what I like about that is it has questions about boundaries and stuff like when can I call you and stuff that the young person might not, not think to ask themselves, mm -hmm. but it does, you know, address information that they they need to know um, related to boundaries and stuff. And other, it has other engagement questions that aren't boundary related, but I think, you know, that's a cool way to um, kind of make it into a game too, but also um, make sure the young person has that, that information up front, like we were talking about. So there, there aren't those surprises later on.
I can we'll share somebody. what. Um, oh, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. So, like what most other people are saying, we we talked about um, really establishing like when we're available and like when we are able to communicate with our youth. Um, and and then related to that, we also talked about sticking to those boundaries ourselves because youth can try to push boundaries and push further and, and reach out when they know you're not available. Um, maybe they don't know who else to contact. Um, things like that. And so holding, holding those boundaries for ourselves um, and, and sticking to that to maintain boundaries with the youth. And then we also talked about um, being really transparent about um, mandatory reporting and, um, and what that looks like and um, being transparent through that whole process with our youth. Yeah, I think you hit a lot of really great points there. And I love what you said about um, maintaining your own boundaries, because one, of course, burnout is so common in this field and you know that's one of the best ways you can prevent that and two you're really modeling some of those self self-care skills and boundary setting skills for your young person um, when you're doing that awesome thank you for sharing everybody it sounds like folks had really great discussions So here we have a little bit about different areas where youth partners might need to set boundaries. So the unique thing about being a youth partner is you're not just working with the one client, right? It's not just your youth. You're working with their parents and their family members. You're perhaps working with other colleagues and other professionals who are involved in the young person's life. You are also probably doing some advocacy work out in the community where you're encountering others who know that a part of your role is to do things like tell your story and really be vulnerable in a unique way that not all roles are asked to do. So we're going to put you back in your breakout rooms um, and we're going to uh, assign each room a uh, um, one of these categories. So youth or young adults, parents or family, colleagues, uh, other professionals. We'd like you guys to briefly discuss some examples of when circumstances might arise where a youth partner might have to maintain some boundaries. Um, if you get a, a, a group assignment where you're like, mm, I don't like that one, feel free to pick a different one. That is totally fine. This is all about learning and just kind of being able to connect with each other and have fun too. So you all are going to be put in your breakout rooms and then I'm gonna pop in there and let you know what group you've been assigned. Sound good? Yep, sounds good. All right.
Okay, welcome back everybody. So let's start with the groups who had youth and young adult clients. What were some examples that you came up with? Hi, um, we had youth and young adult clients. Um, so we all kind of, I, I guess a couple of us had different perspectives. Um, like I come from the mental health side of it, I guess. And my experience where I had to set boundaries with one of my youth clients was when he was in crisis and, you know, he, I, I had to kind of reiterate my role and tell him that my phone is not on all the time. And, you know, he was in crisis. I gave him um, who to call, you know, warm lines, things like that to kind of, uh, you know, calm him down and give him resources that he can reach out to the next time that happens and kind of uh, reestablish that boundary that I am not a therapist, I'm a your specialist. I'm like, I'm kind of like your, um, your ally, your, your person who's right next to you, not above you, not below you, just, you know, I'm here to share my experiences and that's, that's my role and to connect you with other things and kind of like the blue that connects you to other services, you know, if they're willing to take them. Absolutely. I think that's a great example. I know that there were oftentimes, you know, for me, when I was working with youth in crisis, where a lot of the times it was helping them develop a safety and self-care plan, how do we help redirect them back to that, but then making sure, again, that we're not um, putting ourselves, spreading ourselves so thin that we're going to suffer burnout, right? I think that's really important. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, Travis. Yeah, we also had youth and young adult clients, and something that we mentioned was just like the places that we talk about certain things. Um, I think uh, one of the girls gave an example of like, you know, if we're eating somewhere and a client says something, we you know set that boundary of like, hey, like we can talk about that when we get into the car when it's kind of more private and just also allowing them to like realize like there's certain places that you talk about certain things um, and setting that boundary among, among that. And then also just like allowing the youth to set boundaries with us um, so like a specific thing might be triggering to them. And if they don't want to talk about that, um, they don't have to, and like, they don't have to elaborate on anything that we ask that makes them feel uncomfortable. So kind of setting that boundary, it's like mutual, like we don't have to talk about anything that we're not comfortable talking about. Yeah, I love that. And really being able to respect the youth's boundaries, right? Because that's going to teach them how, how can they be respectful of other people's boundaries too? And I think that sometimes that young people often have experiences where they feel like their boundaries are being pretty violated or like they don't know how to set those boundaries, especially if they're multi-system involved. So thank you for sharing that. Okay, what about folks who had parents and family members? Okay, so we had um, parents, family members, caregivers, et cetera. And uh, one of the biggest ones that we talked about was the whole issue of confidentiality, right? When it comes to parents wanting to ask, what's my, especially if you're working with youth, what are they saying? What's going on? Well, I can't tell you, right? Making sure that you try to let parents know as soon as you can that this is going to be confidential. We cannot share information that's being shared. Uh, we also mentioned, um, again, to reiterate our job roles. Um, so if I am a youth um, specialist there, then um, I'm going to be advocating for the youth, not for the parents, right? I'm helping the youth and reiterating that. If people are in crisis, again, reiterating that's not our job. Um, we are specifically this, we are not a licensed therapist to help with people in crisis. And also uh, making sure too uh, that we aren't available all the time, reiterating the times again when you are available, because it's not appropriate if you all of a sudden see someone at Walmart at nine o'clock at night and they try to start talking to you. This is not my work time. This is not when this is happening. So those are the main ones that we came up with. And along with Maybe um, if we're doing projects, maybe changing um, if necessary, what the kids are doing, if the parents, it's maybe something that they don't agree with, but the youth want to do it. Maybe mentioning that they're doing other projects as well, maybe leave out some details if needed. Absolutely. Yeah. I love the reiteration of like, we're not here to um, essentially be like spies for the parents, right? We're not going to be like telling you everything that um, uh, we're going to share things like that. Um, 
And maybe looking into like, what are some of the needs that parents might have when they're doing those kinds of things? And how do we get help from our other peers and colleagues in order to really set those boundaries? So I think that that's something that happens very commonly when we're working with youth is that parents expect that we're just going to report back to them. Um, and uh, that's not the case, right? Um, particularly for young people who are older than 14 and really have the, the legal authority to make their own um, medical and health decisions, so. I think another thing you touched on, which I saw happen a lot when I was supervising youth peer support specialists is that the parent was lacking a lot of support in their life and would, you know, start to um, kind of, you know, make those after uh, visit chats last a little bit longer with the youth peer support specialist or be leaning on the youth peer a lot more, um, almost acting as if they were their peer support specialist and, um, or even be like texting um, my youth peers after hours and kind of venting about their young person or other things going on with their life, which would, you know, complicate the relationship between the youth peer and their youth and, you know, just wasn't appropriate because they weren't there their peer support specialist, they were there to support the young person. So that was when I would like really try to make sure that um, my youth peers were able to have things to say ahead of time to set those boundaries in like a kind and respectful way and also have other resources available to give to the parents like family peer organizations or support groups that they might be able to connect them to if they were open to that. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so what about colleagues and other professionals? What are some of the examples that you all may have come up with? Uh, we didn't come up with anything in specific, uh, like regarding a specific circumstance, but we did note that a lot of the time, sometimes as peer specialists, we are asked to set, what we're asked to perform a role that it's not within you know, our job duties, and it's not that we don't want to do it, but taking part in something that is not our role could potentially affect the relationship and the rapport that we have already built with the youth that we're working with. So really setting those boundaries, and again, like somebody previously said before, redefining what's within our role. Um, we also shared about before getting, you know, starting to work with a youth meeting with the team, something we do quite a bit, and uh, giving an overview of what our role will be within that team as to not like duplicate services. And it's also kind of like as a reminder to let the rest of the team know this is this is what we're doing. Um, nothing more, nothing less within, you know, that falls outside of our role. Um, and setting boundaries with peers within our own also like organization when feedback is gift about like what we could be maybe doing different with our youth or like as far as like suggestions and when there's a push for that becoming also like a really strong advocate um, for our youth and like checking in with them in regards to those suggestions instead of just like jumping right in because at the end of the day we're the ones working with the youth and not our peers, not, not our, yeah, our, our co-workers. Um, so those were two of the major things we, um, we talked about. I think that those are all fantastic examples. I know personally, um, when I was a, a wraparound youth partner, I was asked all the time to do things that were outside of my role. Um, and it took me a long time. I sort of made the mistake of not setting those boundaries very clearly at the beginning. And then having to backtrack and reset them was really, really hard. You know, it sort of became the expectation that not only was I the youth peer, but I was uh, the taxi driver and I was the note taker and I was the one to pick up food for the meeting. And it sort of becoming like almost the, um, you know, assistant class for the team. And so I think it's really important to set those boundaries with folks from the beginning and really clarify what the role is. Something that I can share, um, and I know probably some of you have seen this before if you've been on these calls, but uh, Maria and I have a document on what peer support specialists do and don't do that sort of covers some of those topics. And we can send that out in a follow-up email. 
Well, great yeah. discussions, everybody. Um, so next up, we're actually going to go over some uh, scenarios um, and then have an open discussion on how uh, um, we think that this can be resolved. Maria, do you want to take this scenario away? Absolutely. So Tyler has been working with one of his youth clients, Simon, for five months. He has built strong rapport with Simon, and Simon is accomplishing many of the goals that he and Tyler identified together. Tyler is trying to dedicate his time to other youth clients who are in need of more support. Simon does not like this because it means he will get to spend less time with Tyler. He tells Tyler that it's not fair because Tyler is, quote, his best friend. Tyler is nervous to address this with Simon because he doesn't want to upset him. As Tyler's supervisor, how can you support him? Or so any Tyler, how can you respond? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I think we all probably have seen a scenario like this. So if you were his supervisor or even if <laughs> you were Tyler, maybe, um, what are some strategies you might use in this situation? I've been in this situation too many times and it is uncomfortable, so I can kind of relate to what Tyler was saying, but the earlier on that you establish and make sure that they understand what your role is and that you're not a, um, a best friend, a friend, you're, you're still a, um, a professional, that that can kind of clear or demystify the understanding but if it's already past that point uh, in the beginning, then just maybe sitting down and having that conversation, ask, I, I pose the questions and I would be like, so what is my role? Do you understand what my role is and where I stand with you as, a, as an adult who's been in your shoes? And often at times they'll say, oh, you're kind of like a therapist or they'll say, oh, you're kind of like, they, they won't give me a definite answer so I'll go back to my handbook or the program handbook that we give to them explaining what I can and cannot do and what I, what I um, don't want them to think that I am and just kind of uh, reiterate what I do and that I'm not a friend. I am a professional that is helping them trying to get into a place where, um, you know, they build coping school skills and get to um, other sources that may help them and just get them connected in a way that helps. So. Yeah, definitely. <clears throat> and I mean, I think you're totally right that the best thing to do is, you know, establish that role clarity up front. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even doing that, there can still be understandings as you not or misunderstandings as you naturally build that trust and engagement and rapport that's, you know, so crucial to the peer support role. So I think um, that's a really good strategy of kind of just opening the conversation with the young person and um, exploring what their understanding of the role is and trying to reestablish those boundaries. I also see Goose said in the chat, validate the youth, reassure them that you care about them, and then reiterate your role. I think that's that's really great. Um, because you don't want them to feel bad about, you know, having the misunderstanding. Um again, like that probably comes from a real need and maybe a lack of friendship or, you know, those close relationships in their life. So um, we definitely don't want to shame them or make them feel bad for um, saying something like that. So I love that you said validating them and reassuring them that you do care about them before um, reiterating those boundaries. Anyone else have any thoughts or um, anything you might do as, as the supervisor or as Tyler? Cool. Thanks for thanks for sharing, both of you. So we do have sort of a response here if you're coming from the supervisor perspective. So I really appreciate that we got um, some great youth peer perspective. Um, 
So if you're there to support Tyler as a supervisor, you want to validate that this is an uncomfortable situation and thank it, thank it you, or thank him, geez Louise, for bringing it to your attention. Remind Tyler that he's really helped Simon and it makes sense that Simon feels close to him. So validating those feelings, making sure that to iterate that this is actually a pretty typical thing that's going to happen within our role. Um, this is something that Tyler can share with Simon and he can share that Simon's relationship is important to him, but it's not a friendship. There are specific things that youth peer support specialists have to do that friends don't like mandatory reporting and some case management. Like that would be super weird if your friend had to mandatory report you, right? <laughs> and so I would always kind of, when I was working with youth, put it in that lens, like I really appreciate our relationship, but, but like uh, there is some value added in having friends that like aren't a part of your team, right? And how do we make that happen? Um, remind Tyler that most times when you feel so attached to their youth peer support specialist, they may not have many friends. And so suggest that Tyler start working with Simon on expanding his social group. Um, something that we were discussing earlier with another participant when folks were in their breakout rooms was like, uh, when this happens, how do you help youth connect with other young people? How do you actually help them build those uh, social skills, uh, connect their community, and create sustainable, long-lasting friendships, which is really important because that's the unmet need that we're seeing here a lot of the time when youth are so attached to their youth peer support specialist. Okay. We have so, another scenario oh, here. Oh, no, go for it, Maria. All right, I got this. Okay. So Indigo, a new youth peer sports specialist, tells you that she was asked to publicly share her lived experience at a community council meeting with other professional providers. She felt put on the spot and shared a general explanation of her lived experience and how she uses her story to help support youth. After speaking, some council members clapped and thanked her for sharing her story. This made Indigo feel awkward and tokenized. As her supervisor, how should you respond? So does anyone have any thoughts on this one? And again, you can also share from the perspective, like if you were Indigo, what kind of support would you want or how would you respond? I would have let Indigo know that, you know, it's up to her. It's not mandatory that she shared. Um, I would have, before coming to the meeting, um, would have found out, you know, you know, was it that you're looking for you to share some of their um, lived experience? But to ask her the question, um, her response would have been totally up to her and respected if she would have said yes, because it was on the spot. And not everyone is comfortable speaking. So, and you don't want to put that youth in an awkward position. Yeah, absolutely. I think that that's spot on. So validating that, you know, she, if she can share her story, uh, if and when she chooses to, right. Um, and making sure that she's adequately prepared before she's walking to a room of folks and saying like, is this going to be a space where I'm sharing my lived experience? or is a, my role different in this space? So I think that that's a great way to offer support. Yeah, and I also love that you said like finding out what are they looking for, you know, at the meeting, like are they, are they wanting a young person to share their lived experience? Because I think, you know, when I was um, working as a youth peer sports specialist and a supervisor, I would go to a lot of these meetings and it would be kind of unclear um, you know, I would feel that I was there as a professional, but then sometimes they would be like, oh, great, we have our, our youth voice here, you know what I mean? So um, it's kind of important to really clarify with the other professionals and, you know, with your youth peers, like what, what role are they in there? They're there as a professional, right? They're not necessarily there as, you know, a young person with systems experience. I think um, also just um, as a supervisor reminding Indigo that um, they don't need to do that um, if they're not comfortable and that it's okay for Indigo to set those boundaries. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, setting, yeah, that she should be able to set boundaries around what parts of her story she's comfortable sharing, if she's comfortable sharing it at all. And, you know, I think that's um, something that you can even talk about with your youth peer support specialists ahead of time um, before they get in this situation. So they know um, what, which parts of their story they might feel comfortable sharing if they get put on the spot, because it probably will happen. Um, it's unfortunate, but uh, youth peer support specialists can get tokenized a lot for their lived experience. I know it's happened to me multiple times. So what are some like phrases that they can have prepared um, to feel comfortable um, not, not sharing their story if they want to, they don't want to. And so they don't have to just kind of feel like they have to blurt something out because it can be hard when you're put on the spot like that. Yeah, great responses, everybody. So here we do have a little bit of a response that we drafted for supervisors. So you can thank Indigo for bringing this up to you and assure her that as a youth peer support specialist, she's not expected to share her story unless she sees it fit to help support youth clients or promote mental health advocacy. Some appropriate responses when she's put in situations where she doesn't want to share her story are, I don't see the purpose of sharing my lived experience at this juncture, but I, uh, but I will when I know it will destigmatize mental health. I prefer to share my lived experience with my youth clients, or even a simple, I prefer not to share my story at this time. We also have a strategic sharing workbook. Um, we will either drop that in the chat or send that in a follow-up email along with the other supportive documents that we've talked about today. And uh, this has happened the last couple of times and I hate to do this, but we have other material to get through, but I know that we only have about two minutes left. So we will do sort of a uh, part two next month, I think, unless folks have other pressing topics that they want to discuss. Um, so before we wrap up, we just want to remind folks that you can access uh, um, all of our archived webinars and lots of other supportive material on the MHTTC website. We also want to assure you and remind you that after today's session, there will be an evaluation survey that is sent out um, by close of business. You'll get that in an email, so if you could please complete that. Um, it's really helpful to help us learn how we can create more supportive content and um, things that are going well and not so well. So we would love to hear your feedback. Um, I dropped the links for the what is and and what is not peer support PDF as well as the strategic sharing workbook in the chat, but um, I think we'll also send those out to you in our follow-up email. Sure, well, thank you, Maria. And with that, we have hit 11 o'clock. Does anybody have any final questions or comments? Thank you for, thank you for holding this. This is awesome. It's really helpful. Well, thank you for participating, Travis. I thought think that you had some really good input. Thank yeah, you. thank you, everyone. All right, everybody. Well, we hope to see you next month. Keep an eye out for the email with the evaluation survey. We'll also include a link to next month's topic. Um, and we hope to see you then. Take care. Thank you. Thanks all. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.